Hello, my name is Natalia Yermak. I'm a reporter at the Kievan Independent. Today we're talking with General Ben Hodges, the former U.S. Army commander in Europe. Uh, so let's start with the most pressing question, is we are here in a unique moment in this war where the unexpected Ukrainian incursion in Russia has been going on for over two weeks. It is the first invasion of Russia by the foreign power since World War II. What do you think about this operation and how much of a surprise it was for you? Um, I, I have three big takeaways so far from watching the first two weeks. First of all, uh, once again, uh, all of us in the West and I think in Russia have underestimated Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's ability to put together such a, a capable force and to, to do it in a way that caught Russians by surprise and caught, by, caught many of us in the West by surprise is a tribute to the competence of the general staff and of the soldiers involved at every level. Um, and, and also the fact that um, you've achieved so much in such a short period of time. That, that's the first takeaway for me. Uh, the second takeaway is, of course, we don't know, and nor should I know, the official purpose of this counteroffensive. Um, the, the government in Kyiv and the general staff have done a good job of protecting information. They don't advertise what the objectives are. So I can only speculate, but it, it's clear to me that the, the purpose of doing this, and I call it a counteroffensive more than an incursion because I think about the significance of what, what is being done, um, is to uh, create a bridgehead on the Russian side of the border that denies that area to the Russians for use for, to launch drones or other attacks against Ukrainian civilians or to build up forces. So it's, it's clearing out this area as a buffer that will help protect Ukraine. But it also sets the conditions for additional operations and it enables Ukraine to move forward its own long range weapons that could be used against Russian airfields. And obviously it also affects Russian uh, transportation networks, Russian oil and gas infrastructure, and even puts at risk the Russian uh, nuclear power plant in Kursk. The third takeaway for me is the Russian response. Uh, they have been incompetent, slow, confused, and I think there are several reasons for this. Fortunately, uh, they were surprised, but also they still have command and control problems. Who's in charge? Is it FSB? Is it your Russian general staff? Is it Rosgardia, border forces? Uh, this kind of confusion and the hatred between those different parts of the Russian security forces, uh, I think has contributed to their slow and, and uneven response. As we know by now, all three bridges across the same river in Kursk Oblast has been blown up and uh, it cut off some ways of retreat for Russian troops between Ukrainian border and the river. Do you think there is a high chance that they will be encircled? And is, do you think Ukraine is planning to build defenses across river? So uh, this is a good question that only the commanders on the ground would actually know. Of course, Ukrainian forces will understand the geography here and the topography better than anybody else. They understand um, how significant the destruction of those bridges are to isolating Russian forces uh, on this side of the river. Um, so I would imagine that they've done this and they've used resources to destroy those bridges uh, in order to achieve either the uh, isolation of Russian forces or to prevent additional reinforcements or logistics. Uh, Russian media are now trying to downplay the significance of Ukrainian incursion to the Russian citizens. Why is that, do you think? Why, what does it tell us about Russian army and President Putin's grip on power? So, uh, of course, they're trying to downplay it because this is a catastrophe for, for the Kremlin um, to be caught by surprise like this. Uh, it, it, it doesn't match the narrative that they have been pushing all along. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the fact that they call it a Ukrainian terrorist organ operation and that's why they put FSB in charge of the response is to fit that narrative. Um, but of course, 
I think part of the surprise was achieved because the general staff um, didn't believe what they were seeing. Um, and because of this confused and competing um, command infrastructure where FSB and Russian armed forces hate each other, uh, Rosgardia is pretty much independent. Uh, there's probably incredible amounts of corruption amongst the border forces. And so all of this is being exposed. And um, President Putin has always talked about how, you know, he's the only one who can protect Russia, <laughs> and obviously he's failed, which is also why I think he made a trip to Azerbaijan and Chechnya, and I think he's, and he's doing some other things now to, to distance himself from this uh, catastrophe. What do you think helped Ukraine to achieve what they have achieved in Kursk so far? Number one, very professional secrecy, uh, what we call operational security, where you don't share information with people um, that don't have to know. So that, that's an important part of this, keeping, keeping your plans and preparations uh, secret, uh, hiding the, the buildup of forces, these kinds of things. That's number one. Number two, in the planning, I think they realized, they saw that there was a place where they could attack that was going to be lightly defended. I mean, that from people I have, with whom I have spoken, it looks like there were very, very weak Russian defenses on that side. Clearly, the Russians were either so corrupt or did not dream that Ukrainian forces would attack there. So the planning was picking the right place in which to launch um, such an attack. So that would be the second thing. What do you think about Ukraine's decision to send troops to fight in Russia instead of reinforcing the defenses in the east? You know, I, I keep a, uh, a Ukrainian map, uh, a map of Ukraine with me all the time. And uh, I was looking at it yesterday, and I was trying to measure the distance from Avdivka to Pokrovsk. And I remember it was back in February when Avdivka was finally captured by the Russian forces. I was in Munich at the Munich Security Conference, and people were like, oh, my God, you know, Avdivka has fallen. And they acted like this was Stalingrad or something like that. And from Avdivka to Pokrovsk, I think it's only about 60 kilometers. So in six months, Russia has moved only 60 kilometers, losing thousands of soldiers every week. So yes, it sucks to be the uh, Ukrainian forces there in the, trying to defend Pokrovsk, uh, especially when you know the ammunition and other things are going into this counteroffensive uh, in the direction of Kursk. But it seems to me that the general staff has made a, a uh, calculated risk, which is very, very appropriate and normal in warfare, that you have to prioritize certain things over others. I have been responsible for areas when we were not the main effort and we did not have enough resources. It sucks, but this is this is part of warfare, and so I think you, um, my sense is that the Ukrainian general staff is less worried about what Russia is doing in the east than we are, and that this attack in the direction of Kursk is going to achieve eventually a significant effect, where uh, which will um, I think show that the decision that they made was the right decision. It's too early to it's too early to tell whether or not forces attacking in the east are going to be drawn away to go to Kursk. Um, I had I did speak with a person yesterday with uh, with knowledge that said it looked like some Russian forces in the area of Zaporizhia were being diverted. That's even further away from Kursk. Uh, and if you think about how will they get there, I mean again on my map. I drew a, a basically uh, using a, my GPS on my phone to look at the route from Pokrovsk to uh, Zuzia, okay, just to get an estimate. And that was 550 kilometers. That's straight line going through Ukrainian territory, through uh, Kharkiv to get there. Obviously, that's not a route the Russian forces would take. So they would have to go several hundred more kilometers around to try and reinforce once they started moving. And so if you figure 5,000 troops uh, using trucks, 
maximum 20 soldiers jammed into a truck. I mean, that's hundreds of trucks that would be required in several days to move them, and that's assuming you had the trucks available. So what I'm saying is it will take a long time. So I think it's probably another week uh, at the soonest before we would start seeing significant movement of any forces from the east to Kursk. And uh, with Russian troops reportedly being about 10 kilometers from Pokrovsk now, how do you expect the situation will develop there? And what is Russian goal in the east at the moment? Well, I, I know that President Zelensky is calling on his uh, partners to deliver more quickly what's required. Um, and I think that, uh, well, I, I, there's no excuse for it. it this, is, this has been a failure uh, in the West from my own government. And I'm proud of what the U.S. has done, but we have failed the most important task of committing to helping Ukraine win. And so between us and Germany and UK and the French and other allies, uh, we're not delivering with the sense of urgency that's needed to help Ukraine win. Um, so I, I don't know how or when this is going to change in the, in the near term, um, but it, it seems to me that Ukraine is still figuring out ways to create capabilities even with their own resources. And there are a lot of countries in Europe that are giving up everything they have as quickly as possible. And how would you assess both Ukrainian and Russian resources to continue fighting at the moment? Do you think something is going to change significantly in 2025? Sanctions have been effective, not, not as effective as they should be because there still are too many gaps. Russia is still able to export oil using their so-called shadow fleet and sell this oil to India and China. Uh, even if it's at re below market prices, that still generates income for the Kremlin to continue its war effort. Um, but it seems to me that they have, they have done things that are unsustainable for the long term for their defense industry. That's what it looks like. Uh, it does appear to me that Ukraine is, is rebuilding its own defense industry, even while at war inside Ukraine. A lot of Western companies are helping to do this as well. My biggest concern for Ukraine is the uh, recruiting and training base is not what it should be. Um, Ukraine has enough people. I mean, there are probably two million women and men that are military age that could be serving. But uh, the government has not yet done a good enough job to uh, provide recruiting and training so that families would feel confident if they sent their son or daughter or a brother or somebody to join the army, they're not yet confident that that person will be properly trained, properly equipped, put into a good unit with good leadership. Uh, do you think if Vladimir Putin decides to start the conscription in Russia on a wider uh, scale, do you think it will somehow change the situation and the willingness of Russians to support the war? Well, I think when they start having funerals in Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, then you could see a mood change. So uh, if we can talk about the Western aid for a moment. Uh, reports suggest that it's increasingly slower to arrive to Ukraine and the countries like Germany are cutting their defense spending and therefore there will be less aid. Are you worried about it's shrinking? I'm, I'm most worried about the perception that the Kremlin sees the West losing interest or energy or will to keep supporting Ukraine. Because if the Kremlin sees that, you know, they clearly don't care how many of their own soldiers are killed. All they care about is um, waiting uh, or outlasting the West in its support for Ukraine. So. The, the quickest way to bring this war to an end would be for the United States and Germany and UK, France, to say it's in our interest that Ukraine defeats Russia, and therefore we're going to do everything necessary to help make sure that happens. We have not done that. And so that's why I think the Kremlin keeps thinking we just have to wait. Uh, what are the factors that you think will define the outcome of the war? What is, are the strategies of Ukraine and Russia to winning the war? Well, for Russia, 
uh, they will they will keep going until Putin realizes that he stopped that he can't win. So you know again, human life means nothing to him, including Russian lives. Um, he will keep doing this as long as he thinks that there's a chance that the West will quit or that the Ukrainians will finally say enough and will be willing to negotiate. So so the the principal target for uh, influence is uh, Vladimir Putin. That's that's who has got to be influenced. But I would also say that the Ukrainian side, despite all the incredible successes, the perseverance, the inspirational effort by Ukrainian civilians as well as Ukrainian military, um, innovation, um, courage, all of these things, the government still has to um, make the case to Ukrainian people. I mean, we're, we're past the point where it's patriotism. Now it's like, no, we, this is about survival. And there are millions, millions of Ukrainians in Poland, in Germany, in Romania, including thousands of men that are military age. And I think that the government has got to fix the situation to encourage these men to come back, and women that want to serve, to come back into Ukraine, join the armed forces. So this fixing the recruiting, fixing the education, military education, fixing the training base that can generate the units and capabilities that are needed. Um, you know, a Ukrainian soldier fighting for his or her country is always going to be a better soldier than a Russian who's an invader who comes from some faraway oblast way out in the eastern part of Russia, uh, that uh, the Russian Federation, that's an invader. You just need more of these Ukrainian men and women in uniform, properly trained, in a unit that is properly trained. This is, I think this is going to be key for, um, for Ukrainian victory. Thank you so much for watching this interview. I hope you found it useful. If you want to see more of this in the future, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to support our work, please consider becoming a member at kievindependent.com membership.